35. All right. I might uh, kick things off. Well, welcome everyone to Bill's Declares sixth webinar and our first to kick off 2021. My name's Simon Clark, one of the founders of Bill's Declare and director of Sustainable Homes Melbourne, and I'll be your host for this evening and facilitating the roundtable event we have. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As you know, we have a special event today, Australian Builders Declare Roundtable. Now this gives us the opportunity to talk about the challenges facing the builders at the coalface of building high performing and sustainable homes. And it gives you guys the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. Now, before we kick off, I'd like to just bring you all up to speed with Bill's Declare and what we're aiming to achieve in 2021. So this is our second year of operating, obviously with uh, a hell of a year last year with uh, all, the, all the goings on. Uh, Bill's Declare comes under the non-for-profit group of uh, Green Building Institute. And yeah, it's, it's clear that we recognise as a group and climate uh, activists, I guess you'd say, um, that we need to do more to enable a sustainable building industry. And we understand a declaration and a pledge uh, may not always seem as though it has a strong enough purpose. And we want Australian builders to declare to have a great and positive impact on the Australian construction industry and drive the industry to a more sustainable way of uh, practic practicing. And that's why in 2021, we're looking at creating an online resource to help the construction industry move in the direction of carbon zero construction. Uh, we're looking at having product information on there and product reviews. Oftentimes being a builder specializing in high performance and sustainable homes, there's so many new products on the market, it can often feel like we're reinventing the wheel. And I think to have that feedback from builders that have already been there, builders that have uh, actually applied uh, these techniques and, and materials um, can be a really great resource. Um, we'd love to have case studies on there from builders and, and, and architects and uh, what they've applied into their sustainable and high performing homes. Uh, information to go carbon neutral and and partners in the space that can help businesses do that and just generally builders that are sharing their experiences and that there's more information that will come it's early days and we are looking for sponsors and donors to enable it to enable us to make this happen so please if you are interested please reach out uh, you can email me of course through this event or info at billsdeclare.com so we'll kick off tonight's event, Australian Builders Declare Roundtable. We have five of the founding members of Australian Builders Declare on the panel, each with their own unique experiences of working on and building high performance and sustainable homes, all based in Victoria. So depending what side of the fence you fall on, it's a positive or, or a negative. I know that there's builders out there from other states, so please get in contact. We'd love to get you involved in our Declare movement. Uh, you, again, you can reach out by uh, emailing through this event or info at billsdeclare.com. Now, before we jump into it, I'll give the guys a quick intro and I'm sure you'll get to know them further as the evening progresses. So I'll start off with, uh, we have Jeremy Spencer, who's Director, Builder and Energy Raider at Positive Footprints who's been designing and building sustainable homes since 2001. We have Hamish White, Director of Sanctum Homes, specialising in high performance homes and passive, and passive house. Michael Murphy, Director of Align Builders, specialising in sustainable homes and renovations and helping his clients to convert their homes from gas to all electric. We have Michael Lim, Director of Michael Lim Builders, based out of Geelong, specialising in high performance homes and passive house. And we have Jesse Glascott, director of G-Lux Builders, specialising in high performance homes 
and Passive House. So before I com we commence, uh, this is open to you guys to ask any questions that you may have uh, circulating in your mind. There's a Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. Please be sure to use that box when asking any questions. Please refrain from using the uh, chat box. I won't be able to get the questions in there. Uh, so throughout the evening, I'll be trying to get to as many questions as I can. Um, I apologize in advance. I doubt I'll get to them all. I will uh, generally lean towards questions that are on topic of discussion, the way the discussion's heading. You can also up in the Q and A box, you can upvote a question. So if you see one in there that you do want answered, um, tick to upvote it and that'll go to the top of the heap and I'll, I'm much more likely to get to that. So to kick things off, I'm gonna ask the guys all this question, well, two questions they can choose from. What's the one thing you believe a builder needs to know when building a sustainable and high performing home? Or what's been your biggest challenge building a sustainable and high performing home? And I'll throw to you, Jeremy. Right, well, uh, one thing, one thing is pretty hard to, um, to pin down, but if I was gonna suggest anything to someone who's wanting to build a sustainable home or a builder, I would be making sure that they understood where the impacts are in a home. If we're talking home, I'm a domestic builder, so that's my specialty. If you're doing commercial, where are the impacts in the commercial space that you're trying to avoid? So um, for domestic construction, um, the average home produces seven tonnes of carbon dioxide in, the, in, in just using electricity out of the power points for, to run it. Um, so if you imagine that seven tonnes, where are the impacts of that? Well, the impacts in the house about, if, this is how I think of it, it's not a it's a nice, easy, simple way to think of it. About a third goes to heating and cooling. This is Australia wide. In Victoria, it's a colder state, so we do a little bit more heating and cooling, maybe closer to a half. But a third of your impacts to a half of your impacts go to heat and cooling. Um, and what do you do about that? Well, you build, you know, you build well. You, you build to at least meet, hit all the assumptions in the house energy rating um, certificate. Um, and you put in efficient heating and cooling. The next third, there's only, there's only three parts to this, to this um, seven tonnes of carbon dioxide, or the set, three major impacts. The second impact is a really easy one. Um, that's hot water. Uh, well, with one decision, we, that's, again, about a third of that pie, maybe a, sort of a small third of that seven tonnes, is hot water impact. So an efficient hot water system, with one decision, you can make a very big impact on the impact of the house as a whole. And the last area to also focus on, and this one builders often uh, leave off, is appliances. About a third of the impacts just come from the things that go into the house that the owners often choose. So it makes sense that builders don't get involved in that. But you've got to remember that, that um, builders are often seen as um, authority figures in the build and have quite a lot of leverage to impart knowledge about products that they think are good, that things that worked, things they've tried before and, and that, that other clients have found um, are efficient, but also give a great, uh, great product. So um, yeah, I, I, I would just say those, those are the three major impacts. Um, and, and the last one, and I hope I'm not jumping on other people's query uh, points here, but the last one, I, I've, I've done a lot of judging of competitions over the years and it's always annoyed me when a house has put a lot of effort into being very energy efficient, but have forgotten to put photovoltaics on. Photovoltaics, it's, I know it's a sort of, it's an easy thing to slap something on, but gee, it makes a big difference if you're looking at the life cycle impacts of a home. So um, yeah, know where the impacts are, then you can address them and not just, it, it'll stop you focusing on one area to the exclusion of another area, if you're thinking of that global idea there. That's me. Nope. All right, Uncle Lim, you want to give us? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, very hard to follow that, Jeremy, when I think you covered a very broad 
um, scope of everything we probably look at when you're assessing your build. But um, I think you could even uh, look at a step before if you get to uh, starting um, the build on site and thinking about the design, that's a really important impact. Just um, it's harder to make changes once you get going to the layout and the orientation and things like that, positioning of windows. If you can have a good designer on board and um, get into that before you get through um, the, the starting the works on site, I think will have a, a massive impact on, on your, your build because trying to, trying to make things work once it's already in place is probably an area that um, I, I would consider is something we've faced in the past where once someone comes with a design that they've already got through planning permits and all that side of things, um, if you can get involved in the earlier stages, that's something that is um, really useful to getting a great end result when the, the client also gets the project they want, but it also performs in the way that they want as well. So. I think that's one thing that I would probably consider is, is a pretty key point on um, projects that we've dealt with in the past. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I think anyway. Yeah, I'm sure each of us here, each six of us here has been sent plans from a potential client who wants a sustainable home and have been designed with just no intention of that. So there's an old saying that... Uh, Good design costs the same as a bad design. So you, you gotta get the design right. Uh, Jesse, do you wanna give us your insight into what a builder needs to know? Build a high performing, high performing home, some of your passive houses you've built? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I guess maybe I'll touch base on um, our challenges, what we've faced. Yep. Um, not so much with passive house, but more on the high performance side. Um, I guess I'll split it into two, maybe um, in the office and maybe on site. Um, I guess in, in the office, challenges we probably face um, would be getting, getting the right product for the client um, that sort of meets what, because we, we sort of work in the design and construct, so we're there at the start, which is, which is what you were just talking about, which is what the builder needs to uh, get on board early. So, uh, you know, finding the right product that the client wants um, in terms of aesthetics. Uh, we work in a lot of bell rated areas as well. So that product, you know, if I'm talking claddings, that's got to meet uh, bell ratings. Um, the sustainability of the product has to come into play. So there's a fair bit of research that goes into that and what we can offer. And also the big thing is trying to get it to suit the client's budget too, because a lot of these sustainable products that we want to use out there can be quite costly sometimes. Um, another thing, probably biggest challenge is on site would be a lot of the, the windows that we use for high performance builds are heavy because they're, you know, triple glazed or double glazed and they're, they're big units. So probably, you know, site access and things like that, you've really got to consider. And sometimes you can't use mechanical lifting. You've, Got to get a bit of muscle in there and yeah that's sort of what we found sort of on site with these high performance builds yeah gotcha. that, would, that would be what i'd say yeah all right michael murphy you want to give us your input uh yeah sure i think um as jeremy said earlier you know thinking about what energy and what resources a house uses and and really understanding that um i'm coming from renovation and extension angle more than new homes so certainly looking at you know homes that are currently using really inefficient old gas hot water services um you know leaky homes um homes that have single glazing um understanding that a lot of existing homes and poorly designed new homes are using a lot more energy than they could be otherwise so i, I guess the first point is understanding that the current building industry is, is probably not really building to a very good standard at all compared to what you know most of the people in this group would be building, whether they're, they're passive house, solo or passive, or, or however we're going about it. So the first point is you're understanding you know, how a home uses energy, as, as, energy, as uh, Jeremy touched on earlier, and then you know, what can we do 
to address that and to reduce that and also reduce, you know, carbon and, and gas use in my case, whatever else. So, you know, solar, good insulation, um, you know, good windows, whether they're double glazed, triple glazed, orientation. There's going to be lots of different facets to how that is going to be approached on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on site, budget, and all of those things. But I think to address any of those, we have to sort of fundamentally understand exactly what Jeremy said, like where is the house using energy? How can it be reduced, whether it's with solar, heat pumps, great insulation, good wraps, good glazing? Um, and how can we integrate that into the design and the build? Um, and there'll often be different ways to do that. Um, but I think if that's the goal and there's a good understanding of, of where that energy is going, then, you know, we can come up with, with ways to create houses that are using uh, less energy or in some cases, no energy at all um, that might be, you know, zero net energy. And I think that's probably pretty well the goal that, that a lot of us are working towards in one way or another with differing levels of success depending on you know, what we've got to, to work with, whether it's budget or, or site constraints or existing homes or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think you really need to understand energy consumption um, and how that, that relates to, to buildings um, and the services and the insulation that um, is kind of encompassing of that usage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hamish, do you want to give us your two, Bob? Do you think we've... I'm happy to... Have it. Quickly, I, I might just touch on the first one um, and maybe even just split up um, sustainability and a sustainable home and a high performance home. Now, I'm not saying you can't have both, um, but I'm also saying that you can have one or the other as well. Um, I'd just looking at what how we build or how some of the components that will go into a high performance home. Um, I mean, you could argue that the embodied energy and the products that we're putting into these homes is higher than, say, a uh, traditional um, to code home. Um, but you definitely see the benefits long term with these homes um, using a much smaller amount of energy than a six star home um, that's you know, going up uh, in volume in the estates. Um, what we're trying to look into now as a business is, yes, doing high-performing homes, but how can these high-performing homes also be sustainable as well? Um, at the moment, we use a lot of SIPs um, and we'll probably continue to use a lot of SIPs, but we're also looking at um, other ways to, um, I guess, get the same benefits of either modular building or, um, you know, that real dense insulation you get with um, EPS foam or XPS foam. Um, and I know Jesse's used wood fibre before as well, but um, on some upcoming projects, we're looking at using wood fibre, which I believe is a far more sustainable um, insulator. Um, it's a really great, uh, really low U values. Um, so yeah, I think it's important. Um, so that was... Wood fibre, so, sorry, you, you, wood fibre, you, you not, don't mean CLT, what's... Wood fibre, wood fibre insulation. So there's a company called Life Panels bringing out. Jesse, what's the name of the product that you use? Parvotherm is the product. Yeah. What's that? What is it? Sorry. There's Parvotherm. Parvotherm. Life Panels are bringing out, and then there's Gutex as well. Yeah. I think there probably is a few more, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'm digressing just a little bit. I guess what, what, what we're trying to do as a business is to understand, um, I guess, split the two up, you know, sustainability um, on, you know, on site for us is, you know, minim minimising waste recycling, uh, making sure the products that we're using in our homes are, you know, the Tim's are FSC credited, you know, where are we bringing these products in from? Um, and then, you know, looking at the high performance side of things, which I think is more sort of benefits of post-construction. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I, I would say to, to builders coming in just to think about both of them um, and they're not always grouped together, but you can separate them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got you there. Got a question here from Alistair. It, it, it may be erring more toward uh, an architect question, but it's certainly uh, based on uh, Michael Lim, what you were talking about with getting um, design, good design. So um yeah, do you want to comment further on um, window sizing and performance of windows, i.e. double glazing? Um, 
and the likelihood that um, Melbourne, um, well, Melbourne homes need double glazing um, to be seven star, especially when those standards come in, which uh, has got here perhaps 2022, which Jeremy, you might know more about. Uh, I was going to say it's probably something Jeremy knows a, a lot more about, but it, it is there's positioning and sizing of windows is very critical on the, the performance of your house. Um, and to, to, to achieve a seven star, you, you wouldn't be able to put the wrong windows in the wrong places anyway, but um, it, it's going to govern uh, sizing of windows um, and the performance of them depending on where you're trying to put them. Um, because it, the software just won't stack up when you, you're trying to position them in those places. Obviously, the outlook of a build will influence what you are trying to achieve. If you've got a great view in a certain direction, then um, that will influence what glazing you're trying to install in that location. So um, to achieve that, you're probably then going to have to upspec glazing and things like that. But um, yeah, regarding sizing and uh, going to seven star, I mean, Jeremy probably knows more about whether that will be seven star, but the um, performance, like it's very hard to consider anything less than a double glazing. It's what what treatments the glass will have now. And then um, whether it's triple glazing is probably where you're looking at to, um, to achieve specific glazing for the, the project requirements. Um, is there anything else you would add to that, Jeremy? To so I, I would just add to it um, that it's it's definitely possible to do a seven star house in single glazing, but you have to have good solar access to do it. Um, so and you have to have you know site conditions going for you. Uh, so often in suburban Melbourne, you're not necessarily going to have those conditions and. There is no doubt that double glazing um, is, is a really useful and, fan, and fantastic addition to just about any um, any home. The how how to know how much look this this is how we do it because we do design and construct as well and I do energy rating. So um, typically we will try and get northern sunlight into as many rooms as possible because we're in the southern hemisphere. The sun goes over east to west, but it's on the northern half of the sky, and so you want to get as much northern in as possible to an extent. Um, east is a good direction if you're, if you're looking at, at getting, putting in windows. The reason being we're in a, what's called a heating climate. We're trying to get our houses warm for most of the year. If you can put windows on the east, then the house starts to heat up a bit earlier in the day. So east is a little bit better than west. South is usually in shadow. So we, we're really just putting windows on south to, uh, encourage breeze paths through living spaces and, and bedrooms and so forth and to pick up views of course. So once once you've done the process of putting you know slightly more windows on the north and the other directions then really um, before you go any further I would advise um, people working on plans to get an energy rater involved. Get, get a design that you're happy with, that the clients are quite happy with, and before you do working, working drawings, town planning, anything else, send it to an energy rater. And th the reason I say that is because the software, the NATHER software models the sun rising and setting in the climate of the house, you know, every 30 minutes for, for a whole year and the, the wind blowing and rain falling and things. Um, and it will look at the energy coming in to that, to that particular room through the glazing and it will look at the, the mass of, and the volume of space that it's heating in that room. And while you can have sort of rules of thumb and there are plenty of um, books out there with rules of thumb of, of sizing, it's not until you do that, an, that analysis, that mathematical analysis of the software that you can get the correct ratio and you can start to get the energy rate. Ask them, what's, what's the best size window I should have for this room? Um, and sometimes I get clients who, you know, they, they want to go, big glass because they, 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 they just want to go floor to ceiling glass and you know probably even on the north that's not that's that's usually too much glass because you have to remember that even with double glazing even with triple glazing the sun's only there for you know for half the time and half the time is night time and typically cold and your windows even if it's 
um, you know, even if it's triple glazed, compared to the, the well insulated wall next to it, your windows are like a big hole of just losing heat. So um, there's definitely a balance to be struck. So you work with sort of rules of thumb in, in the design, but then get an energy radiant vault to actually size up if you want to really go for the higher star ratings. But to answer your question, can you get seven stars of single glazing? Yes, you can if things are going your way and you've got a designer who knows what they're doing. Um, but even then, double glazing is great for strength. It's great for uh, it's great for quietness. Uh, as well. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a lot of other reasons just to put in double glazing. Yeah, is there a rule of thumb, Jeremy, to, um, as to the window sizing based on the window of this uh, room area? Yeah, there is. So um, the rule of thumb is with single glazing, uh, if you've got 100 square metres of floor, or okay, they, they talk about a net condition floor area percentage ratio and, and, and they, they have a number of 22%. What does that mean? That means that if you've got 100 square metres of floor space, you can have in that space up to 22 square metres of window, right, if it's predominantly to the north. That will, that's sort of a general rule of thumb. Now that can go up to 25 to 30% if you've got a bit of mass in the room because the more mass you got in there, especially if the windows are pointing the right way, shaded in summer, but let the window sun in, that mass will have the ability to absorb heat. Um, and so you can then, it, it doesn't matter if your window, you can have a, a slightly bigger window because you absorb more heat during the day and it's then radiating off at night um, and keeping the temperatures nice and high even though heat is still rushing out through that window, you've, you've absorbed more during the day. So you can push the numbers up a little bit, but if you're getting over 40%, uh, 50%, it, it doesn't really matter how good your windows are, um, that house is not gonna perform well. Yep, makes sense. Oh, Michael Murphy, throw this one at you. Uh, do you see yourself responding to clients' requirements for sustainable housing, leading them? or a bit of both? And what strategies have you used for leading clients to a sustainable outcome? Good question. Um, I'd say for myself, it's, it's probably a bit of both. Um, when people reach out to us as a builder, that they're, they're hopefully already somewhat interested in, in sustainable building. And we ask them about that, you know, are you interested in that? And, and I'll usually know a little bit. They might have read um, about an all electric house on, on the, the, the My Efficient Electric House Facebook page or, um, you know, be reading a new magazine or, or they'll be somewhat educated um, and I'll have some ideas and then we'll sort of see where they're at and, you know, pick that up and, and roll from there. Um, so I'd say it's a bit of both most of the time. Um, in terms of strategies, I guess I always like to find out if there's an existing house, what they're using at the moment and finding out what their gas bills might be. And it's always interesting when, you know, typically people have got central ducted gas, maybe it's a family. And I ask them, you know, what are your gas bills like? And they kind of, you know, their eyes roll back and they're like, it's really expensive. Um, at the moment we've got a house that's uninsulated um, and they're kind of looking for a better way usually. So it's then a matter of us saying, okay, well, what we're doing at the moment is, we're switching to all electric. We're suggesting you do solar panels and we're looking to update ins you know, insulation and, and glazing. Um, and you know, one of the challenges, which I think was a separate question we might jump into later is, is, is what are we gonna do to counter that? Because there's lots of different ways and different levels um, we can reach that. Um, so yeah, I'd say we would try and come up with some solutions to, to the, their problems for us with renovations and, and extensions, it's it's a different house each time with a different level of glazing insulation. They might have some insulation in the ceiling that they got in the bat scheme, but there's none on the floor and there's none on the wall. So every house is different. So we're trying to understand what that is. And then we're trying to come up with some solutions which are gonna be the best value outcome for them. So they've got a comfortable home, um, which is using less energy. So yeah, it's a bit of both. Um, it certainly makes our life I'd say I'd probably speak for everyone a hell of a lot easier when the client's actually interested in sustainability. Um, and we're probably not that interested in trying to feed into someone who's really not. Um, and I'm, I'm finding more and more people are really happy to hear about it. Um, it's a challenge to sometimes tell them exactly what the payback period is gonna be for putting in solar or increasing their insulation because every household you know, uses energy slightly differently but we try and give them some rough payback times. And I think once you're sort of starting to put some data 
into the dollars and cents of it, um, it, it makes e economic sense um, as well as, you know, sense in the sustainability from, from that point of view as well. Yes, yeah, spot on. Um, economic sense. Hamish, would you like to add to that any further? Like, I always try and um, keep in mind the with me. Is it with me? What's in it for me? I think as much as, you know, we're trying to, well, we are. I mean, I think we are building sustainable homes that are much better for our planet. At the end of the day, it, it should be better for the consumer as well. And, and Wade here has also mentioned, um, it feels like the big talk uh, is trying to reduce bills and lower costs. Of course, that's a big um, perk for people looking to build high performance and sustainable homes. Um, and, I, and I just add and just and just be comfortable as well. Like it's great to save money and you know also save the planet, but it's also nice not to be freezing cold every time you walk past a window or you know whatever. Um, so that comfort level, whether it's passive house, solar passive, whatever, clients are always delighted by that as well. So I mean that's that's a big thing as well. Mm -hmm. So. It, it, Took us, I would say, I'll probably answer this question a little bit roundabout way. It took us about 18 months to kind of get a bit of traction around um, people coming to us um, as a solution to people wanting to build um, a high performance home or a passive house. Um, fortunately for us, the projects we've got going on now and you know moving forward are all high performance or certified projects. Um, I think there's always a selling point to any client on the benefits of building a high performance home. It's either, it's good for the environment, which you look at any con energy consumption, um, carbon footprint, carbon emissions, all that kind of stuff. You know, that's one client. Um, budget or, or um, uh, the cost of running a home. So it comes down to economics um, and health. So, and sometimes people want all three of them, but I, I, I genuinely believe whatever side you're sitting on, um, there's benefits to a high performance home. So whether it's health, um, running of the home or from a sustainable or environmental point of view, um, you know, and hopefully you're hitting all three of them. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think there's always a, an opportunity to, to educate people of the benefits of it. And I guess you just need to pick your, your angle. Um, I, as I said, ideally you're hitting all three, but um, I think there's enough information, enough benefits in any of those three points to get someone across the line. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, add to that um, for any builders out there. I, there's very few clients who are interested in solar heat gain coefficients or R values or um, uh, coefficients of performance, um, you know, and, and that techie sort of stuff. That's not how to market. Um, what you should be marketing, like we pick, uh, picked up before, um, these houses are really well insulated and that makes them quiet, warm spaces to be in. You know, the temperature doesn't fluctuate like it does outside. The design, we put some effort into the design to pick up the, the summer sun, uh, the winter, it's, sorry, the winter sun. So this, this, this place is, is going to be light and it's going to be bright and it's going to have that great connection with the, with the rear yard. Um, yeah, of, of course, the, the, you know, th this house is going to be so, ch you know, so cheap to run as well. Um, oh, and by the, by the way, we've, um, we've built this house using materials that don't off gas. That means that the air inside is going to be much healthier for you guys to breathe. And, and we put in either a ventilation system, maybe if you're doing passive house, or we've hung the windows to pick up the summer breezes. And, and so you're going to get more fresh air through. Um, uh, you know, this, this, this house is a, is a sanctuary uh, for your family to grow and thrive. You know, that's the sort of uh, language, I think, that, that sells these places rather than, yeah, rather than the techie stuff. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to go into a bit further off gassing, Jeremy? Um, so, so you're talking about MDFs and formaldehydes and that sort of thing? That, yes, yes. So that's what I'm talking about. Um, this, this is, look, this is very important to fam, um, to, particularly to young families with kids. Um, this comes on their radar, but really for anyone, it, it, it's, it's useful. And it's just the fact that uh, we don't, we, we build our houses a lot now with compound materials. That is not solid materials. These are materials with MDF and, and glue and, or, or plastics and 
binders. Um, and they're not 100% inert in that um, over time, chemicals will you know, leach out into that internal environment, especially if you're, if you're making your place really quite tight. Um, those things, th those chemicals can build up. Now, each one of those chemicals has limits that the government puts on. Um, there's been, I don't want to scaremonger here. Um, there, are some, there are some things that we know are on the, like the International Cancer Council's list of carcinogenic compounds that you want to keep down. And, and there are other ones that we know are endocrine disruptors and, and have, can have bad effects at high toxic levels. What we don't really have the data on is in humans is prolonged living in a lot of these spaces. But uh, you, we often get clients who, who know that they're chemically sensitive in, 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 in one way or, um, or they just wanna take the precautionary principle of if we can avoid these things, let's avoid them. Um, and it's quite, uh, well, it's not easy, but it's doable nowadays to look at the different materials that are going to the home, find the tech specs of what their, what their VOCs are, that's what you look for in the specification, what the volatile organic compound levels are, and just choosing ones that are uh, what they call low VOC levels, just as a precautionary approach. And the ones that you really want to focus on are the big surface areas, they're, they're, they're the important ones. So flooring's really important because they cover a big surface. So they're gonna have more of an impact than something that only covers a small surface. Paint is a really big one. Um, it's easy to get zero or low VOC paints these days, which is great. Uh, and you, you certainly know the difference if you if you used to work with the old paints, that they, the house would smell of new paint for a long time with, with paints these days. Uh, we use one, once it's dry, it's just like it's always been there. So. Um, Anyway, that's what that's what VOCs are. It's 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 easy to, well, it, it's possible to start building up a list of products, um, and you build these things over time as as you're a builder until you you've got like just your go to products which you know um, are low VOC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that, Jeremy. Uh, I'll, I'll go to a question from Ron. He's a developer in Melbourne's northeast. Um, does he feel the panel? Does the panel feel clients are willing to pay more for a new build if it will demonstrably save money on energy and water? So, Jesse, I'd like to throw to you, get your input. I mean, my opinion is it's yes. And, and I think we are, I feel like this is a feeling. I don't know how far you can take that, but that we are moving towards it a time where people are starting to prioritize their homes more and more, especially with the whole COVID fiasco, we're spending much more time in our homes. As Jeremy just mentioned, we don't want to be around um, homes that are toxic and um, off gassing that are drafty and cold and costing a fortune to heat and cool. So I do think that people are certainly willing to spend more on that. And, and there's also, <laughs> clearly the added benefit of saving the planet. You know, we, people are much more conscious of the, the change in our planet and, um, you know, to, to, to be part of the problem um, and then handing over to our kids. It just seems crazy to me, but I'll, I'll leave my opinion there. Jess, what, what are your thoughts? Do, do you think clients are willing to pay more for a new build that, can save money on energy and running costs and, and water. Yeah, I agree, Simon. Um, I think a lot of uh, clients that come to us, um, they have in mind that they want to build high performance or passive house. Um, so they already know <clears throat> a lot about it. So they know um, there, there is a, a, you know, a slight price increase in that product. Um, they've already got in their mind that's what I want. Um, the bells and whistles of the house don't matter so much to me. I want the performance. I've got my family that's going to be living here for, you know, 30, 40 years to come. I can always, you know, update the kitchen, which probably happens every, you know, 15 years anyway. So uh, they are willing to put their money into the actual fabric of the house, the, the, the comfort, thermal comfort of the house. Um, we have had a few developers um, sort of 
jump on board and said they want to do a, a a two like a townhouse development, one passive sort of one high performance, um, or you know possibly you know live in the passive house, sell the high performance, and I think yeah that's it sort of seems to be increasing in demand. The uh, being able to sell that product out there is definitely growing. Uh, I also also you know recommend. Um, the, the developers maybe, I think there was one passive house that I'm aware of that's been sold um, so far, I think. Do you know where that was, Haim? Was that in South Australia or maybe? Someone might know. Um, but like, it's pretty rare out there to be buying um, these houses. Um, they're still, they're still quite, quite new out there. So I could, I'd probably recommend it would be a um, a popular choice for people to go and buy if, if the market's out, you know, if it's out there. Can I, can I quickly jump in here too? I mean, um, in Canberra, and I know this because my wife's from Canberra, um, all the homes and realestate.com there actually show the star rating there, uh, you know, as a, as a marketing point, um, you know, and the higher home, the higher star rating homes are, I think, anecdotally are getting more, uh, a, a, a more popular and getting a higher value. Um, I, I, I absolutely think that the market is pushing for these homes and I think they're going to become more valuable as we move forward. You know, sitting here at the start of February in 2021, are they more valuable? Maybe not. I would say give it 12 months to five years and, and I, I would be incredibly surprised if these homes weren't more valuable than um, the current stock that's getting built at the moment. Um, and I'm mm. pretty for that. Yeah, so that's EPCs you're talking about in um, Canberra, with Energy Performance Certificate, which... Yeah, I, they're, they're a slightly different thing there, but I, I just... Right. That, that the, um, Jer Jeremy might actually know a little bit more about this than me. I, I just know that on the, you know, flicking through real estate up there, they always have the star ratings on the homes. Um, and, you know, real estate agents are always very keen to, you know, if it's a seven or eight, nine star home, they'll, um, they'll put that front and centre. Mm, yeah, there was on. an article in the age some time ago saying that generally speaking, sustainable homes would fetch an extra, I think it was three to 5%, which is substantial when you're talking about a house worth, you know, 500K or, or more or whatever it's worth. So there has been some, some analysis of that, um, for Ron, so yeah, the, I think the general answer is is yes. Um, and if you're someone who's buying a home or you're you're a consumer, like why wouldn't you want to buy a long term investment which is going to cost less to run? Um, payback might be five years on a heat pump or, or solar or whatever, and then after that, you know, you're literally making money or saving money. Um, and I know there's a lot of people on the my my efficient electric home group who are delighted every month when they're in credit and they're, they're getting money back. They're not actually, you know, getting an energy bill. So I would say yes, for sure to that, to that question. And I totally agree with Hamish as well. I think as there's more and more talk about sustainability in the, in the media um, and in the building industry, it's going to be more and more sought after. Yeah. It's all, it's, it, it, it's all education. And, and I think over time, <laughs> You know, sustainability and, and high performance homes aren't, aren't going to go away. Our, our, our carbon issue isn't going to go away until we look at it seriously as a society. It's just going to become more and more pressing. I, I think also um, a lot of people don't realise that you can make huge savings these days and the cost return on the technology over the last five years that the, the technology has come together and the price points have come down to, to make to make it really realistic to have very low carbon outcomes, which, which what they mean, if you have a low carbon outcome, it means you're not using very much power. And, and the typical bill say is about 2,600 for a dual fuel house in, in Melbourne. Um, now you're still gonna pay your connection fees, but effectively you can be looking at almost $2,000 saving um, from putting, putting in a high performance home with the right tech um, every year, you know, for the every life of the house. Year, yeah. Right, and they're, they're, they're relatively quick paybacks. But that, that information isn't yet in the marketplace. You know, a, a, 
what's in the marketplace is thoughts from 10 years ago, or, uh, you know, it sounds nice, but it doesn't have good paybacks, doesn't make sense, you know, doesn't make economic sense. And I, I think it's just a matter of time and, and sites like that Facebook group, My Energy Efficient Home, 20,000 members who regularly contribute, you know, it, it's just a matter of time till that sort of thought spreads out and, uh, you know, becomes... Yeah. Anyway, that's 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 my thought. I I think it's definitely a winner. I think we're at the start of something that will just grow in that respect. Uh, but I would also say one one last thing I'd say. At the end of the day, when you walk into a house to buy a house, it's got to it's got to feel right to you. It's got to have something special to you. It can't look goddamn awful, <laughs> even mm -hmm. if it's super efficient. So. Um, design and good design still always play a part. If you've got a good design, uh, and often, you know, I do, I do passive solar, but I know that passive, passive house also use passive solar. There's so much overlap between them, both of them. At, anytime you, you're inviting the sun in and you're, you're focusing on rear open spaces, it, it's, just, it's just a winner. So not only will the house perform well, but it'll just feel nice. So yes, would be my answer. Will they hold value? Spot on. Might uh, change direction here just a little bit. Um, what Aaron's asked. So after our, our webinar with Paul Ha, he went to his suppliers in Geelong and asked them um, where their pine was coming from, but no one's gotten back to him. And, and I've, had, <laughs> I've had a bit of the, the same years years ago. But um, where can you get pine that is not Balti pine or, or timber that is from Australia? Is is the first question, which I don't know if we know the answer to, but first, further to that, we've got Tom here, who's from the Wilderness Society in Tassie, and his question is about FSC certified wood. And, and do you reckon it's a key thing about using ethical timber, um, making it FSC a bit more user-friendly and easier to use? And I think we could all agree on, Tom's got here, would, would a definitive buyer's guide be useful? And I'm... Um, I think we're all screaming out for something like that. And certainly a, a stockist guide that can, there seems to be a lot of confusion in, in this arena and I'm still, I won't say none the wiser, but I still struggle to really uh, define where we're at with it all. Can anyone, <laughs> I don't want to pick on anyone here because it's a bit of a challenging topic, but can anyone throw in their two bobs? How they yeah. go with, um, yeah. Yeah, I would say um, with the FSC pine um, in Geelong in particular, I went to a couple of suppliers at Bow and Timber. So they're a particular supplier in Geelong. Um, they were saying that at that time their pine was from Colac. Um, and so they were able to get an FSC accreditation from there. Um, and they had certificates and things to back that up. Um, but it is still a process documenting it all and, and making it um, something to show for the client because if they're asking for it, they want to know where it's from and, and how you've got it. So it, if it wasn't from there, there's another supplier who said they could get it, but then that was a lot more work to get all that information. So yeah, certainly a, a guide or something would be great to have for um, the sourcing and um, documenting of all the information um, but that I did know that we could get it in Geelong at that point um, from that local uh, supplier in Colac but um, I haven't <clears throat> looked at that for a good six to 12 months so um, to, to revisit that so it would be um, interesting to see how they're going now because there's been a massive obviously timber shortage at the moment and I know a lot of suppliers were topping it up from stuff overseas so um, and they're not able to get that and so that's what's impacting their shortages so what, where it is at the moment would be interesting I don't know if anyone else has got um, more information on that but that, that's my understanding at, at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add to that uh, yeah tim, timber is a minefield um, in the absence of, of any certificates, if you do go to, um, to your hardware store, if you look at the end grain of, of your pine, pine will typically be a, it's a faster growing species. The, 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 the plantation pine here versus the, um, 
the spruce uh, overseas, um, which is a slower grower. So it, if, if the grain is quite wide apart, then it's probably pine from Australia or New Zealand. But you know that that's just a a rough guide if you if you don't if you're just there in the shop and you need to make a choice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We'll certainly have to follow that discussion up, I think, and then get a bit more clarity around it mm. for sure. I, I think I think following a hierarchy to say, okay, is it probably the best we've got at the moment for all its deficiencies is FSC. Is, does it have FSC rating? Fantastic, that'd, that'd be good. Or recycled, probably even better, right? This, this is just in the list of, of what's good. If you don't have that, um, is it a plantation timber is, is probably the next, next one down? Or maybe is it a bamboo, right? Fast growing grass, those two usually pretty good. Um, and then I would go for, isn't an Australian timber because Australian timber is is covered by PF, PFC and 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 some legislation. Mm. You know, it might be a bit of hit and miss sometimes how it's how it's implemented, but um, at least we got we got some <laughs> oversight on it. Uh, and then I'd start looking. You know, the, the next would be bring timber from overseas, from you know, <laughs> non PFC sources, or you know, that's where I'd get a little bit iffy and a little bit shaky as to um, trusting it. Yeah, okay. Certainly not, the sil certainly not the silver bullet, but also there's the um, great reference from uh, the Mullinon Creek development in um, Donvale, uh, the Mullinon Creek Timber Products Guide. Mm. Yeah, I certainly jumped on there and downloaded all those resources. It's super valuable for any builder looking to really consider what they're building materials they're using, super. Yeah, there they used to be two great resources. Um, the Greenpeace had uh, had the Good Wood Guide, or good, and then there was a Good Wood book as well that was put out, I think, by Friends of the Earth or someone um, <laughs> that maybe like 10 years ago, but that was a definitive book, which was really nice. Okay. Look at that up. Yep. Well, perhaps that's something that can, you know, we can incorporate as part of this, you know, online resource, a, yeah. a guide that can be updated regularly you know a book's pretty hard to be distributed and updated so yeah or even things like michael michael said there you know um he was just at a at, at his local bowens or wherever it is down down in geelong mm -hmm. um and you know he can get fsc certified timber and this is the person to talk to yep so that that sort of information would be brilliant for builders yeah so we've got talina on here hi talina and she's asked is there a true timber shortage in your opinion, um, due to supply demand, and and she's heard that builders are stockpiling it like toilet rolls. Maybe Hamish got a few tucked in the backyard. Uh, I don't have so any room there... in my backyard, <laughs> <laughs> and it's on and it's on a hill. I'm not I'm not carrying it up there. <laughs> so yeah, I certainly heard there was a shortage late last year. I, we were told to get our orders in. I, I don't nothing really affected us. Anybody else been affected with any shortage in timber? Well, well, I haven't been affected, but I had a, an official email from both yeah. Bowens and Home Hardware saying, That's right. yeah, price increases between 5 and 10% and they're expecting a shortage of, of not just pine, but other materials as well. I was told due to the boom in DIY activity um, was the reasoning for it. Um, whether it's true or not, I'm not sure, but I think it would be pretty hard to orchestrate a widespread conspiracy to say there was a timber shortage if there wasn't, um, but I'm not, I'm not certain, but um, yeah, we've, we've certainly been notified that that, that might be coming a little bit later this year and, and they're not sure when, but there's rumblings about it um, for us, but we haven't been affected by it as yet, but yeah, can't, can't say whether it's legit or not. It, it sounds le legit to me. Yeah. We, we would tell that. Australia relies on spruce a fair bit for their pine, as well as using the radiator pine. And obviously when COVID hit, um, Europe slowed down their production a lot um, and therefore um, less spruce coming into the country. So therefore, yeah, short pine shortage. Uh, but we haven't really had any trouble. Um, I know speaking to some of our trust manufacturers, they were saying they were stockpiling, um, like Talina said. 
Um, but yeah, we haven't had to do so. Yeah, the only shortage I've had is uh, on bamboo. So we do a few, uh, quite a few solid bamboo stairs and um, getting the thick bamboo ply is difficult at the moment. Mm -hmm. Ron here said there's a huge shortage of recycled timber. Um, I don't know why that would be, but um, it can be a challenge to get certainly recycled timber. Um, the right recycled timber, I guess, when you're after something rather specific. I think um, that might always have been the case. Yeah, it's always a, I, yeah, a bit of a challenge. Now that, now that people want recycled timber, there's only so much of it to go around. Yeah, it's interesting. There's, a, there's, a, there's only so many old wharves and um, yeah. jetties out there. Mm, mm. Okay, we've got a question here from Georgie. There's been mention of you know, wood fibre insulation before. Are there any other products out there that the panellists are passionate about? That may not be used extensively in mainstream construction. This would be a good sort of topic to cover that we often speak about. Anyone okay. want to take it away? I could jump in here and talk about a project we've got starting in the next three or four weeks. Um, it's a it's a, another certified passive house, and we're using hempcrete for our um, insulation, but also our external cladding, which will have a lime render, and also our internal. I wouldn't call it cladding, but it will build up. So think of a rammed earth wall type scenario, and then we'll <laughs> have lime render externally and internally. Um, so I'm pretty excited a bit to see how that performs. And I think a 300 mil wide um, hempcrete wall, the very limited studies that have been done are getting about an R4 rating, but I've been told from our hempcrete contractor that it it is higher than that, um, but that's what's been put into our PHPP analysis. So yeah, pretty excited to see how that all goes together and to, to show that off as that project gets out of the ground. Yeah, that'll be a good one. Welcome, Murphy, you, you got something that you're a spokesman for? I love short foot footings. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of am always a little bit depressed when we pour a slab um, or put a sheet of concrete in the ground. How much concrete we use sometimes in construction. Um, I'm in the Western Melbourne, so we have highly reactive soil around here and there's also um, quite a lot of rock in the ground. So yeah, we've been using sure foot footings for quite a long time, which is um, essentially a steel system where poles are jackhammered into the ground. Um, they're appropriate to use on, on any site and, and they're basically a completely concrete free footing system where there's no digging or very, a very small amount of digging um, and no concrete at all. So you can save a massive amount um, of concrete on that. Um, and Hamish and I actually had a chat last week about slab systems and um, I'm sort of working on a, a proposed design for a reduced um, slab system that might sit on short foot footing. Someone's done something similar before, but yeah, certainly reducing the amount of concrete and the amount of wastage in the ground is something that I try and do. Um, and we're sometimes switching slabs to super insulated um, subfloors. I love using LVLs and using nice thick ones and, and filling them with polyester insulation, which is nice and rigid. Um, polyester insulation is another product I like. Um, but yeah, short foot footings, definitely happy to give them a wrap because I've been using them for a few years and we've saved a lot of concrete from using them. And they're super strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Follow-up question for you, Haim, is uh, did you get your hempcrete out of France? Is a question. Um, to, to answer the question, I'm actually not 100% sure exactly where our product will be coming from uh, at the time. Um, I don't think we're going to be starting the hempcrete for another three months, three to four months. So exactly where that's coming from at this point in time, not 100% sure, but um, I'm pretty sure it's coming from Europe somewhere though. Well, I think you can only get certain components from Australia. Um, is it the, there's some stuff you can get from Sydney that they farm up in Sydney or up in New South Wales, but the binder, I think the binder you've got to get in from, um, from Europe, but they've, they've got a much better binder We've got a project coming up for the same thing. So. I know the project. 
we do. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, other? Yeah. Okay. So what have, what have I used? Um, I mean, I use I use a hell of a lot of um, recycled brick. Um, and, and bricks are great. Uh, and it, you can often, when you're demolishing a house, there's often a fair bit of brick in there. Um, it's not that hard usually to uh, demolish it and clean the bricks on site and then reuse them again. That actually has a lovely story for the owners that they've, they've still got the old house there in a sense. Um, the spirit of the old house lives on sort of thing. Um, so that can be great. Also, you know, we, we do a lot of it on, on the inside um, so you've got the reverse brick veneers, you've got the mass benefit of bricks. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate for using that material. Uh, another material now, I've used... On that, Jeremy, do you, mm. do you find that a challenge with that in making it um, sort of economical for the client? I've found in the past that um, you know, Australian labour is a super expensive element of construction and... Um, so I often leave that. I, I, actually, yeah. quite a few of our clients are are okay, or okay to do it. You know, they yeah. they they're happy to come in and on the weekend. That right. um, look, there is a labour component. If it's on site and you're doing it on site, it and and you're going to bring in bricks anyway. No, it, it probably works out almost even. You know, <laughs> like to get someone there to clean them versus bring in new recycled bricks. Um, because if you bring in new recycled bricks, we've well, got to pay for the bricks and, and the transport. And instead, that money's now gone into, um, you know, we've got a, a little guy with a, uh, he t puts a tea towel on his head and, and brings, brings a little barbecue and, and he's got his hatchet and um, cleans. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so that, 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 that's quite cute. There is a, one, of the, one of the issues is just how much you have to pay labour because that's, that does stop a lot of recycling happening. Um, not that I want us to become a third world country and, you know, scouring the, the garbage heaps um, like some do. But it is a shame when you demolish a house and there's actually a lot of lovely timber in there, but it's all got nails in it and it just costs too much to take those nails out. It's, it's cheaper to bring in, you know, new timber, so you send that off. Um, so there are, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of issues with the way that our economics is, is set up and doesn't um, give true value to resources, I, I don't believe. And yeah, mm -hmm. so a lot of issues there. Um, another product that, that I really love is, um, I don't do much of it, unfortunately, is uh, mud brick. So mud, mud brick, especially for internal walls, again, it's got a lot of mass to it. Uh, owner builders can do it themselves. Uh, it's really easy to lay mud brick because they, they um, it, it usually doesn't matter. They don't have to be as precise as it's like doing a brick wall. And it, you know, if, if your brick's sticking out a bit too far, you can knock it off. Or if, it, if it's not far enough, you get some some mud and just sort of slap it on and <laughs> fill up fill up the gap. So quite forgiving material. Not fired, so they have a a, a, a very low embodied energy. Um, and uh, oh, and the good thing about them, they they stop sound between areas. We, we just it, it's not bad to use them between living spaces and bedrooms because because they really dense stop the sound, and also because they're not a fired product, they tend to be able to absorb humidity and release humidity. So if if the room's getting too dry, they release a bit. If it's getting too moist, they absorb a bit. And so effectively, they're sort of controlling a very even temperature or very even feeling if you like in in the room so anyway it's just another interesting yep. product uh, to use uh, and i just did a a, a a life cycle analysis on a new range of homes that we're putting out to the marketplace and one of the big winners on that was polished concrete um and the reason it's a big winner is because a lot of over the life of a house a, there's a lot of energy that goes into replacing floors. So, you know, every 20 years or whatever, you, you rip up your floor or, you know, change your carpet, whatever, change the tiles, change the look, whatever. Um, whereas they're, they're much more, a polished concrete surface can basically has a longer lifespan. So it um, doesn't have as much maintenance to it. Uh, typically, uh, and what I really love to do is, is um, you can you can just use well we have in the past used grey concrete just just standard rather than a special expensive polish mix um, a thirty two MPA version you 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 get them with you know, your fly ash and your and your um, you know your low embodied concrete basically 
Um, and then you can spruce it up yourself. We've, we've, we've put in recycled glass in the past to, to give it a bit of bling. Um, just from that we got from Vizzy, where there's mountains of old glass. Wash it to get off all the, um, wash it with soap and then, and then hose it with water because you want to get off any sugars and that sort of thing. Um, but that, that comes up a treat and um, then you can polish it and it, it's sort of the, anyway, it's got coloured glass through it, which is really nice. You, uh, Schnepper glass do a similar thing if you don't want to go to that effort. They've, they've got um, recycled glass that they sell as a, as a product. Um, so anyway, those are some ideas. Yep. Like. Another one here for Jesse or, or Haim, Hamish there. Uh, from Audrey, have SIPs panels, have they gained any traction or are they not really economical yet? I know you guys were talking about it before. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So generally we'll sort of do the numbers on a SIPs or just your conventional stick build. Um, and we've had some cases where the SIPs have, have come out to be a cheaper solution and a better solution. And we've had cases where, yeah, they were just far too expensive and just didn't work. So I guess it depends on the design and um, also access because, yeah, you've got trucks and cranes and stuff like that as well. So it's, it's really on a yeah, job by job basis, I'd say. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I definitely think that there's more interest in it. Um, and I definitely agree with Jesse that it is case by case. I would probably argue that I would at the very least try and get a SIP roof on most of our projects just because you can really quickly get um, the building reasonably watertight very quickly. You know, you can fly a roof on in a day and then, you know, put your breathable wraps, whether it's Proclimber or whatever product you use, um, and you're essentially got a, a, a roof on your head where you, if it does start to rain, um, you can be working inside or working under cover and the job can keep progressing. Um, I love SIPs. Uh, when, when they arrive on time uh, because of the speed at which a building can go up. Um, you know, you, you, we, we installed some SIPs two weeks ago um, and now we've got cladding going on, the roof's on, um, the rough-ins completed and uh, we've got plaster going on in a week. So when everything lines up with the numbers and, you know, the SIPs getting to site, um, I, I love it. I think it's a really great way to build, but... You know, whether that's SIPS, CLT, HB or some other prefabricated um, model, I think, um, and probably to answer a question that Daniel's thrown up here, um, mm. I think prefabrication is going to be huge um, moving forward in yep. the panel space especially. Mm -hmm. We'll go back to you, um, Michael, regarding Surefoot. I've um, got a question here from Simon who's interested to see if you've um, had any movement, um, we're aware the west of um, Melbourne, Victoria is notorious for movement. So how have your shorefoots performed? Um, I'm pleased to say I've never had an issue. I think we've probably done eight or nine projects on, on shorefoot footings, like major extensions and renos. I had a job in Kingsville where we had a lot, one of those freakish weeks of, of rain um, just after doing the subfloor and we had sort of some stormwater diverting sort of set up, but, you know, there was, there was pools of water around just from the sheer amount of rain. Put a laser on the floor and it was perfect. But um, no, we haven't had a single callback um, on cracking as yet. I tend to put a little bit of extra bracing in um, over the min minimal amount because we know we're going to have so much movement in these areas it's nearly always a P site or a H2 site for us. Um, so yeah, pleased to say no issues. And I was chatting to a client today about changing their entire house from stumps to shorefoot because you know, for us, there's less risk as a builder. Um, we know that four poles in the ground is, is gonna be more solid than a stump. Um, and we weld a post to the shorefoot and then that picks up that from there. So the entire assembly is more rigid than a stump that's got a little bit of concrete underneath it that's sort of also got soil around it. It's it's welded in place. So yeah, it costs slightly more, but like in the scheme of things, it's 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 fairly neg negligible in terms of the price increase. And when I tell clients the benefits, they're 
they're pretty happy to pay an extra few hundred bucks or, or a grand or two, depending on the size of the job, to get a footing system that is that good. Um, so yeah, super happy with it. Never had an issue. There's obviously much less hassle having to, you know, the, the logistical challenges of getting concrete and stumps oh, in a site. Yeah, and like it often saves money as well. Like it would be worst case scenario, it would cost more because soil removal is expensive and, and laborious. And we're talking before about the cost of labor or trades or, or anything really in Australia these days. Like it's not getting any cheaper, it's getting more expensive. As, like you, that, if you can get your shore foot or even screw pile, and something Michael and I were talking about the other day, you can get that down in the morning. You're framing a your subfloor that afternoon. Like yeah, it's, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, shore foot screw piles, and I'm a big advocate for both of those. You know, yep. reducing the concrete. Hey, hey, Michael, one one question then. Um, with with the shore foot, shore foot, is that something you put in yourself, or do you still need a contractor? Yeah, you can put them in yourself if, if you want to. Um, and we used to do that. Um, my carpenter's got pretty quick at being on a jackhammer all day, uh, pretty quickly, and asked if we could get them to do it. <laughs> okay, all right. So now we do get them to do it. Um, and look, that's probably the best bet because they, they'll do it quicker than someone who's never done it before. And I think I was telling the group earlier, it's, it's, it's pretty comparable to the cost of stumps or or sometimes less, and because they can take a lot of load, I'm mm. often re-engineering subfloors. So we're, you know, we're getting engineering layouts from engineers that have got 25 stumps, and we might be reducing mm. them to half. Where we're upping the LVL, we're putting an R4 or an R3.5 insulation um, in the floor instead of an R2. I was having a chat with an energy rater a couple of weeks ago about how that was actually going to have a, a pretty reasonable impact. Um, and we're just reducing the amount of timber and the amount of material being used by by kind of, I guess, value engineering and efficiency yeah. engineering anyway, which if you're a builder or a carpenter, you're, you're probably usually doing anyway, but it's just sort of taking it to the next level. And yeah, mm. it's a win-win. I think it saves money. It's more rigid, quick, better for, for highly reactive sites. Screw piles are the same. Both, both really good. Yeah. We did use them years back and I really liked them. I don't know why we have we sort of stopped. I think we might have to jump back on the train. <laughs> Um, recently, uh, we've recently just done board piers, but um, we couldn't use screw poles in this option, but we use helix micro bar in the concrete mix instead of um, the pile cages. Oh. And out of about 95 of the piers, probably half of them had cages in it. And I think we worked out, we saved about two tonne of um, steel that went into the Rio just because of that. And, and yeah, it just saves a lot of time and trying to get the cages in, um, you know, and pouring them on the day. There's, there's a fair bit going on. Um, it was a little bit of mucking around to get the plant, to get the helix fibres to the plant, get it mixed in and all that. Um, but it was, yeah, it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's fascinating. So that's just a product that goes in the con, just gets mixed in the concrete you, and you don't apply any steel cages on site. Yeah, so we got, got the engineer to look at it and obviously... Um, do the comps and make sure he was happy with the, going from the, the standard Rio to the, the Helix micro bar. So I got a little stainless 25 mil um, bar. And then obviously depending on the, the strength needed in the footing is how many kilos per cubic meter goes into the mix. Yeah. Gotcha. And obviously that, yeah, it's gotta be certified by the engineer and the building surveyor as well. Mm. All right. Uh, okay. So we just, We've got a heap of questions here that I'm not going to get to all of them. I know that there's one about Nature's for Jeremy, which I think I might um, pass on to you, Jeremy, and perhaps um, I think it's Tia. You can, I'm sure you could be happy to assist. Yeah, look, email. Tia, maybe it's, it's a bit hard to actually tell without looking at the plans, but I'm, but I'm happy if you send me the plans. I'll, I'll cast my eye over it and if I can see any thing that's obvious <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that yep yes yeah, so you could just uh, yeah jeremy look, yeah, yeah 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 jeremy like, at positive footprints.com.au just just send me uh send me a full thing done all right further on so we, we'll go for about another 15 minutes everyone <laughs> uh thanks for sticking around plenty of value happening uh alice has got a question here it's kind of a a, a big question to answer i think but 
what's the group's thoughts on raised floors rather than slab on ground on constrained sites versus sloping, flood prone zones, reactive clays, et cetera, et cetera? I'll go throw my two bobs in that in a city, a flood prone site, we've found uh, concrete slabs to be much more effective and easier to use basically. Um, we had a site that was in between two sites, obviously, and um, it was the lower of the three. And so we had um, the water from the neighbors running into it. So that was actually a subfloor that we had to put a heap of drainage and actually fans underneath the home. And we learned that lesson. And so since then we've gone with inner city, we've gone with um, concrete slabs um, on ground. Um, can anybody, it's kind of a big question, but can anybody else add to that one? So site specific, project specific design. Yeah, um, totally. I agree with I agree with you though. Um, uh, that in in a city slab on ground, I don't know. Purely from a, especially if you're doing an extension, we just done one in Abbotsford where similar to you um, had uh, really poor inch, uh, ventilation in the front front part of the extension. Uh, and in hindsight, we should have just left the two front rooms and continue the slab all the way through. But um, yeah, it's so site, site specific as to what works over the other um, and possibly a combination of both mm -hmm. ground and subfloor. Yeah. Yep, I agree. So I, I have a real love-hate relationship with slabs. Um, um, basically, from a buildability point of view, you have to deal with with concreters and the concrete truck turning up at the right time, and and um, it's a stressful a stressful thing, um, and and you're always worried that that it's that it's not going to go right, and then you're going to be left with a half dried slab <laughs> that you have to somehow rectify. Uh, however, we we use them uh, often, and the reason that we use them often is that or where, where we can normally is because they're one of the most cost effective ways of getting a bit of mass evenly distributed throughout the building. So you, you typically do get a better, more stable performance out of a house if you put in a concrete slab. Um, the, the other reason that, that concrete is, uh, a concrete slab team typically rates up well, and I saw one of the other comments was talking about is a is Nat Hur's bias against timber floors. It's not that it's biased against timber floors. Timber floors, um, the, issue, the issue with them is that you're trying to heat your home to 20 degrees. Timber floors have to have uh, ventilation openings around them. And so you might be heating to 20 degrees, but you've got five degree air at night coming in or, or, or zero degree air, right? So you've got say a 20 degree temperature differential potentially underneath your floor. Whereas with uh, concrete slab, the, you know, un, under your floor, you, it might only be 16 or, or down to 14 in winter or something. So you, you've got less of a, um, yeah, less of a temperature differential. Um, and one, one thing that, that, that we do though a lot is we put polystyrene in the form of waffle pods uh, in our concrete slabs just to slow the rate of heat loss to the ground. Because even though the temperature, temperature differential isn't that great, as a, as a timber floor, it's still a highly conductive material and so it does take heat reasonably quickly. Um, so a bit of insulation does wonders under a, under a concrete floor, especially um, in that situation you're describing, Simon, where you've got wet, potentially wet soil because it's, it's sort of a naturally low point um, that will just exacerbate heat loss through, uh, through a concrete slab. That's why I like them. Why I don't like them is that I'm thinking now about end of life and we really haven't touched on um, waste and, and, uh, and building and all that. And maybe that's another conversation, but at the end of life, what's going to happen to all these slabs on ground, especially if they're mixed up with polystyrene. Um, at, at, at the moment you can break up a slab and if it's just steel and concrete, somewhere like Alex Brazers will recycle it. They'll crush it all up and they'll use a big magnet to pull out the steel and, and they can use it as a road base. But I know that once you put polystyrene, once you try and recycle, 
uh, it's now considered a waste material. You know, it, it's it's contaminated uh, as far as they're concerned, at least with current the, their current practices. So potentially, you know, not good after the life of the building. Anyway, that's my um, <laughs> my, my love hate uh, relationship with it. I have tried um, just recently doing a job where. I've still kept the concrete slab, but we've done it as a suspended um, concrete slab on a bond deck. So we, we did uh, we did adjustable steel um, pillars um, or stumps, I guess you call them. Unfortunately, we didn't use the short, but that would have been lovely because we did uh, have significant concrete piers holding those stumps. Um, but then, uh, then some I beams going across, some sort of smaller gauge I beams. Uh, and then we just slotted in some polystyrene uh, and bond deck, and then over the top of that a concrete slab, and you're sort of ready to go with the idea that we can just unbolt at the end of lifetime, slide out the um, slide out that polystyrene, use that again, and or potentially use that again, and cut the slab up and take it for recycling, um, or even use the beams underneath because. Anyway, yeah. so the, all I'm saying is, is uh, what am I saying? I'm saying that we should all start thinking about <laughs> where what happens to our homes at the at the end of uh, end of their life, and that's probably uh, uh, another thing to focus on once we crack the carbon question. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think we can all agree that I mean everything you look at as a builder is is case by case. Like the first thing I do when I arrive at a you know, a half fallen down home in Footscray is, is get the laser out and see yeah, how far out of the ground the house is. And, you know, if it's half a metre out of the ground, well, great. We can build a, a timber subfloor if, if site access is a nightmare and it, it's going to be really hard to do a slab. Um, but, yeah, if it's sitting really low on the ground, then maybe it has to be a slab. Um, and, you know, what sort of concrete, like, did, does the, the owner want concrete finish um, for the floor or, or not? Or would they prefer floorboards? And yeah. you sort of have that chat. And, and I'm often looking as well, at like, is, is that slab actually going to get a lot of sun on it? Because um, as Jeremy said, yeah. if there is going to be great, you know, solar gain coming in and heating up that concrete, it's a fantastic thermal battery. But maybe if that area is actually really shaded, it's going to be a bit of a heat sink. Um, and maybe if it's going to be an nightmare to build that slab in that location, we might reassess that. I've changed a few subfloors to slabs and vice versa as well, depending on site circumstance. So I think the one answer is there's, there's never a one answer, you know, that's going to be site, that's going to go across every site. It's going to be site specific, project specific. Um, and we're all probably trying to reduce the embodied energy whatever that solution is going to be. Um, I think another, um, if I can just jump yeah. in one sec too. And I think there's one thing that Jeremy uh, does really well because he's designed, build, but um, one thing that we, I think, do reasonably well is because we're involved in most projects from the beginning. Um, not only can we value manage project from a cost point of view, but we also have quite a big influence on the buildability of a project. Um, I'll use the project we're currently doing at the moment in Kyneton um, we had a huge influence on how that slab was designed. Um, we eliminated um, a whole bunch of internal beams because we didn't think they were necessary and we challenged the engineer um, to remove some of them just to reduce the amount of concrete. Um, we also challenged them to completely uncouple the slabs. So we're actually using less insulation when we're detailing our footings um, with our XPS foam. Um, we also got the slab thermally modelled because um, at one point we had 150 mil of XPS foam just so we could reach the R value that was required to reach certification. So we paid out of our own pocket to get the slab modelled. Um, so we actually reduced that to 75 mil foam. So I think as a builder um, of high performance homes, I think we can also add a whole bunch of value during the design process. And I, I, I encourage anyone out listening who's gonna be building a home is to engage a builder early. Um, there's always a better way to do things. And I think it's just, and Michael and I were having this conversation the other day about it, um, you know, just thinking about a better way to do something just because it's written, you know, and drawn one way, it's not necessarily how it should or has to be built. Um, yeah, that's my two bobs worth. Yeah, a very valid point. Such a good point. And like SIPs, panels, recycled concrete, a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do and trying to push is is not 
the way that conventional buildings are being built in Australia or Melbourne right now. And I think we're all trying to make it a little bit more mainstream, a little bit easier, a little bit cheaper, uh, and sort of maybe try and systemize it a, a bit better. But there's certainly questions being asked. And yeah, I feel like we're just at, at the beginning, but we've all got these different methods of that, that all challenge conventional building to a degree, I think. Mm. I mean, it's a great thing about this group and uh, hopefully that the resource that we're going to um, hopefully provide to everyone on the website is to have a whole bunch of information of different products and systems and building methodologies that we've all tried and used and tested and, you know, encourage other people to add their experiences into it as well so we can build better buildings and make it more mainstream and bring the price down and... Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a great thing spot on love it oh we might just finish off there's sort of two questions here that uh are combined i'll start off chris has asked how can we drive the shift in mindset needed obviously budget need budget needs to be directed towards building high quality buildings first and foremost obviously fittings fixtures finishes need to be of good quality but they're not the top dog is Chris's point of view. And Sue's gone on to further mention the my efficient electric home is great, but it doesn't necessarily represent Joe Average, who's interested in the number of bathrooms, cost per square metre and wow factor. So what ideas do we all have for growing the pie of clients interested in sustainable housing? So it's a great Michael, question. Yeah, Michael Lim, I might start off with you and get a get a insight from each of you, and we might call it call it a night. Yeah, um, it's it's certainly one that we that's probably something we all talk about pretty regularly is the um, education, um, getting people to appreciate what the benefits are, um, getting it in front of their faces so that they see it and appreciate it and the ideal scenario would be that a client comes to us already knowing what they're trying to achieve and, and they're just coming to us to make it happen more so than um, which I know is probably not going to happen immediately there's going to have to be a bit of education happen over time and that's obviously part of what we're doing is trying to spread it so that there is more information there available um, aid for builders and, and that to be able to educate their clients and, and people who come to them. So the, the word starts to spread a bit more. Um, yeah, I, I guess in a nutshell, that would be my first point of call is trying to get that um, understanding of what the benefits are to the clients. Um, yeah, I think that would be the, the first response to that. Yep, Jess. You want to add, add to that yeah, one? I, I agree with Michael. I think um, give them the facts. Um, if you've got the time, you know, produce a, a spreadsheet for them. This is this is the amount of emissions your, your house is going to produce, a gas home compared to an electric home. Um, I think facts is always, you know, talks to talk instead of assumptions. Um, if you've got homes, um, you know, almost finished before handover and you, you know, and your client lets you bring, bring your proposed clients through, show them, they can touch and feel. Everyone loves to do that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, I, th I think um, just, just, just be honest with, uh, with what results they're going to get. Just don't bullshit them really. Be yourself. Yeah. Yep. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? It's, it's obviously a, a grand old, topic and a challenging situation we're all trying to sort of influence we're all trying to change the mindset of the, of the greater community so any other tips and tricks look i um, think it's really growing like uh, especially if i talk on the passive house side of things i think the last 18 months it's it's grown a lot a lot of people know about it now um and yeah i think it's i think we just have to wait for that ball just to keep rolling and um the more people know about it, the, the more builders on board, the more it gets out there and uh, the more people are going to want to build these comfort homes instead of all the bells and whistles. So I think it's just a little bit of a waiting game. 
Another thing I'll say too, um, and maybe Jesse and I are probably a great example of this. Jesse and I live in the same suburb. We have a very similar business. Um, we talk regularly. You know, the success of what Jeremy's doing, you know, is only the success of what we're trying to do. You know, the I'll talk specifically about the passive house space. We have a lot of conversations with other builders on Instagram about um, wanting to get into passive house, wanting to learn about the products, want to learn about what we're doing. And I know personally, I love having those interactions. I love talking to people about it. Like I don't see it as being a threat to what we're trying to do because I think, well, what we're trying to do is actually build better homes. And if more people are building better homes, then, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's awesome. So, you know, the, I guess what I'm trying to say is the space is so welcoming. Um, everyone wants to try and help each other out. You know, there's, it, there just doesn't seem to be any of that, um, you know, well, I'm going to keep my cards close to my chest because I don't want you doing what I'm doing. There's none of that. Um, and I guess the beauty about this group too is, you know, we're all builders. Really, we should be competing against each other, but we're absolutely not. You know, we're trying to help each other. We're trying to build better homes. We're trying to make our businesses better and get the message out there, which I just think is so awesome. I think that's really well, really well said, Hamish. And and I, and I I know for myself, and I'm sure for everyone here, yeah, yeah, we want to make a living, right? But but <laughs> we chose this sort of building because we want to make a difference. You know, uh, a life is more than just a living. A life is also contribution, and uh, and that's why you know the, the the mission of Positive Footprints, and probably for all of us, is really to spread an example and spread knowledge uh, to, to move the industry in a more sustainable direction. So, um, yeah. Mm. Awesome. Viva Builders Declare, let's, um, let's get some, for get, sure. get our website going. Uh, yeah. Get some information <laughs> up for people. <laughs> I think part of that challenge is, is us, like which we all do have te technical knowledge is, is probably simplifying it, explaining it, and marketing it with the benefits. And we've actually spoken about this a few times as a group is like, how can we get a, a clear message to, to people out about, you know, what the benefits are of building passive house, sustainable house, all electric, whatever it is. And I think it's a work in progress that we're all, we're all still learning about and we're all still, you know, getting better at it. And we're all still practitioners that are, that are fine tuning what we're doing every day. I think this is a part of it. And, and the sharing of information is, is awesome and inspiring for us, but um. I think we're getting there and we're going to keep getting better at it. But I, I think probably clarifying what it is and, and what the benefits are would be a big piece of trying to grow that pie to the average punter who's maybe not super interested in sustainable building already. Um, and we're talking about it and we're working on it um, and, and we'll get there, but it's, I think it's a work in progress and it, and it will continue to be. Yep. I mean, you're spot on, Michael. At, there's still confusion. Consumers still, and yeah. they're not convinced on the payback or they're not convinced of the cost there's so much that still seems to be unknown to consumers i just don't think i think a clearer message and ron has ron has he referred to as case studies and i think those um examples will be huge for consumers to see yeah yeah i i can give case studies definitely i mean we all can give case studies and that'd be a super thing to put up on the website I think the one of the issues is that we are in the custom home market, right? And so for the average punter, they go to a project home, right, which is a different market, and then they're comparing your product versus a project home. Now, I, I always try to educate and say, to let them know this, the, the difference in, in, in my selling price is not because of the sustainable stuff that I do. It's because each house is, is a one, is a one-off house designed, you know, specifically for you. It's not a big box thing. Um, and, and, and we have a certain quality that, that we, that we offer our clients because those, those are our client base. So it, and if, if you actually just look at what makes us the, the sustainable part of it, um, you know, a, a, a project home or, or, or a non-sustainable custom home, you know, I've, I've added it up before. Uh, it, it's around, you know, it's this side of 20 grand and, and you can have a, a really, you know, low carbon, you know, low carbon home. If, so let me just, let me just add that up for people. 
to, to go from single glazing to double glazing. If, if you just got your window and you're just changing over the glass, right? Uh, th there's about 7,000 in, in, in a, uh, a house lot, if it's just a reasonable size house, this side of 200 square meters, J just to change. So there's 7,000. Um, if you're putting in a, a heat pump, uh, hot water system, or maybe there's another three grand over just uh, a cheap gas hottie. So that there's 10,000. If you've, um, what else goes in? Solar system. Solar system is really, really cost effective at the moment. If you go with one of the, the big, ins, the big suppliers. Great um, rebates too. Great available. rebates. You know, you might be able to put a, a six kilowatt system on for five or 6,000, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, or, you know, or less if you're getting both the Victorian and, and the, uh, the, the, the national rebate there. Um, let's say 6,000, that, that's 16,000. Um, oh, and insulation. So, so we spend more time doing insulation um, uh, and, and we go maybe some slightly higher insulation value. So there's maybe two grand of just time spent filling gaps and cracks and, and taping properly to openings and, and just s spending some effort. Um, now there's other things obviously with sustainability that you can do, there's water tanks, but if we're just look, focusing on, on sort of the carbon question, that, that sort of, that's sort of it. Any house that does that is going to be having very low, you know, might have a very low, uh, you know, carbon footprint, I guess. Um, now, of course, you can, you can spend more and do the reverse brick veneer throughout and you get to nine stars or 10 stars. Uh, getting those, those bits of extra and you're going to pay a lot to get that last little <laughs> of, of, but it's going to be a beautiful, you know, beautiful house and you maybe get the resale on it. But if you're just looking at what are the big ticket items that, that will make a significant difference, it's actually not, you know, it's not that high. And the payback for that, okay, you may, you may have spent 20 grand there. The payback is, is that you might be saving around $2,000 a year, uh, you know? So those are pretty quick paybacks for, um, for people. But that, that information just isn't, isn't, you know, out there. Great. All right, we've run over time everyone's just about stuck around. So obviously a heap of value to discuss, to offer and receive. Thank you all for joining us for Bill Declare's first round table and first event for 2021. We'll be back March 10th. Uh, Jeremy will be presenting again on where buildings fail. So that should be a corker. Looking forward to uh, hearing that one. <laughs> And, um, yeah, it'll yeah. just be lots of photos of my buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeremy's got lots of experience. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, look, keep us posted. Uh, yeah. Join us, uh, Builders of Clare, on Facebook, Instagram, and all the rest. We've got a Facebook group, um, regular discussions where we can. And, uh, yeah, get in contact if you are eager to help us out with this resource to help the Australian building industry move to a, a more sustainable future. So thank you all again. See you all in March. Hey, Cheers, Tom, guys. Thanks, thanks guys. panelists. Thanks, guys. So I'm trying to jump sorry. in just one sec. Um, obviously, there's six of us here from Victoria. We would love to have some interstate people involved. I know I reached out to the Shelton boys last year. Um, you know, Christmas came and went. But it'd be really awesome um, if anyone in any of the states around Australia to reach out and, you know, even um, join our fortnightly meetings just to get their insight and, you know, maybe start uh, getting a little bit more traction into state. That would be awesome too. Yep. Totally agree. Great call at home. Uh, and Simon, there's a couple of questions here. What if, that we're not obviously not going to be able to get to today. Mm -hmm. What about those people who type questions? Are we going to, I try and get yeah. any answers back to them. <laughs> um, that's hey, a good Simon, question. Do you, want a do you want a screenshot of it send it out to us and we'll uh, email a response? Yeah, I, I will be able to retract the content. So um, that's no dramas. But I, I'd encourage anybody with any questions to email in info at buildersdeclared.com and we have a team of guys here to, to help. Uh, of course, we can't get to every question on a night like tonight, but there's uh, plenty of hours in a builder's day to answer email. So um, 
I'd encourage you to do that. Um, you can you can access my email even through this uh, webinar, or um, certainly you know you know where each of the builders is from. Reach out wherever you can. Join us on Facebook. Join us on Instagram, and let's get a real solid dialogue going. And let, let's let's help each other and, and help Australian building industry in general. Cool. We'll leave it there. Thank you all for joining us. Ben, it's been great. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, See you.